My name is Manuela. I'm a program manager on the Parks Customer Advisory Team, where we work closely with customers to help them accelerate their adoption and establish a power platform center of excellence in their organization. We'll spend the next hour and a half or so talking about managing and governing the power platform at scale. We'll start off with a brief introduction, answering the why, before diving deep into our administrative buckets of secure, monitor, alert and act. I'll also share some further resources at the end. Things are changing dramatically for application development, BI and automation. In the next five years, there'll be more applications built than in the last 40 years. A total number of 500 million apps that will be built. And the demand for mobile apps is one of the reasons for this. We see the demand grow five times faster than IT can deliver. One of the reasons for this is that 86% of organizations struggle to find technical talent to tackle this huge backlog in their enterprise for building apps. That's why it's more important now than ever to empower new and different talent to become developers. And that's where low code comes in. Gartner actually predicts that by 2024, 65% of app development will be done with low code. That's where the Power Platform shines. A single low-code platform across Office 365, Dynamics 365 and Azure, as well as your standalone applications. Four compelling, incredibly strong individual products. Power BI for analyzing, Power Apps for creating web and mobile applications, Power Automate for robotic and digital process automation, and Virtual Agents for creating chatbots without writing a line of code. All of this powered by common components like the common data service, data connectors and AI builder providing single integrated solutions to solve enterprise application development needs in a fast and rapid way, whether it's professional developers, IT pros, or citizen devs. All the new features over the last year and the support of our great community have helped the Power Platform rapidly grow. We've seen a 700% growth in production Power Apps, so apps with a specific number of monthly active users and unique users, as well as 300% growth in Power Apps active users. All of this is fueled by the 3 million monthly active Power Platform developers that are out there. The Power Platform is designed for ease of use for business or departmental users, the world's growing citizen developer community. Yet it also offers functionality required for experienced developers. The Power Platform is also built to support the needs of modern IT teams and admins, from automating mundane IT functions to providing security, compliance and control over the usage and execution of Power Platform services across the IT ecosystem. As the number of developers grow, governance becomes more of a key criteria to ensure that digital transformation provides a desired positive effect. With more developers, there are more potential gaps and areas where an organization may fall out of compliance or experience security issues. Some of the concerns that we've heard from our customers are listed on that slide. Having strong governance is a fundamental requirement for an organization to experience the full benefits of digital transformation. Governance is a foundational part of the Power Platform because of its importance in the new world of end-user developers. With the Power Platform, governance is a mandate and the Power Platform capabilities help promote the development and strategy of how an organization can manage an IT environment that includes citizen developers along with pro developers. The Power Platform also offers flexibility and customization on how an organization is governed. As with many IT initiatives, governance is not a single step. It requires focus on multiple aspects, and this slide here is really the talk track of the session. These are the core components of how to think about governance and how to practically apply it. Secure, you can also think about as your setup. How do you set up your environments? How do you set up your environment strategy? How to think about security and data loss prevention policies? We also have monitoring. So once your environments are up and running and your users are building content and resources, you want to have the ability to go and monitor how the system is being used, who is creating what resources and who is using them. And then we have alerting. So once you get more sophisticated and build up your policies, how you envision the platform to operate and run, you can automate your policies, set up alerts, or be notified when certain conditions are met, meaning you don't have to go to a dashboard and monitor, but react to certain behavior. And then we think about automation, your application lifecycle management policies. And then we have nurture. Sometimes it's not a discipline that we typically think about when we talk about governance and administration, but it is critical to think about. You set up governance to establish digital guardrails so your makers can create with confidence. Really, governance is not the end goal, 
The goal should be to enable your developers to empower subject matter experts and to unlock digital transformation opportunities. But first, let's secure. An important part here is to understand where your apps and flows come from. Office 365 and Dynamics 365 include seeded licenses that enable users with those licenses to create apps and flows, and some of those experiences are deeply integrated with Office 365, for example, where a Power Apps and Power Automate button are part of the SharePoint navigation. Individuals can also sign up for a community plan to try out and test Power Apps and Power Automate. And then, of course, there's premium standalone licenses, giving you the ability to build standalone apps and flows. In today's world, end users and departments are increasingly seeking out and buying technology solutions on their own. We've received numerous requests from customers to enable self-service purchase for the Power Platform product. We're responding to this customer need while also balancing the need of an IT administrator who oftentimes loses visibility and control when individuals within their organization adopt third-party solutions without their knowledge. With the self-service capability for Power Platform products, IT admins will have complete visibility to all self-service purchases taking place within their organization. And data governance policies set at an organization level will also apply to subscriptions purchased with the self-service. Additional to that, administrators also have the opportunity to turn off self-service purchase for the Power Platform. When you work on administrative activities, you will work with different portals. The Microsoft Admin Portal for everything to do with licenses and users. We now have a unified Power Platform Admin Center, which is really exciting, especially for those of you who have been with us for a while and have worked with the Power Apps, Power Automate and Dynamics 365 individual admin center. So all of that has been unified into the Power Platform Admin Center. And then there's the makeup portals for building apps, importing solutions and building flows. Um, to manage the Power Platform, you have the global tenant admin role, um, so full administrative privileges to the entire tenant. The Power Platform or Dynamics 365 service admin role to manage apps, flows, environments and then a delegated admin role, which can be used by partners to provide support for our customers. Let's now look at a demo of the Power Platform Admin Center. So I'm in the Power Platform Admin Center, the place to manage your Power Apps, Power Automate, and Dynamics 365 resources. Um, on the left-hand side, I've got the navigation here. Um, at the top, environments. We'll deep dive into those um, later, so I'll skip that for now. Um, under analytics, I've got capacity where I can see the capacity available in my tenant. So I can see the database, log and file usage. Um, I can look at the storage capacity um, and see what each environment um, is using. I can really drill down into each environment to see the database, uh, file and log usage uh, and what's, what's consuming the capacity in the environment. I've got common data service analytics, um, environment level analytics for the common data service attached to that um, environment um, that shows me active users, um, API cores, API path rates. Um, I can drill down into entity usage um, so I can see information on the most used um, entities, I can drill down into API core statistics, etc. For Power Automate, I can see daily, weekly and monthly runs at an environment level. I can change the filter here and select a different environment and the time period goes um, as far back as 28 days. I can see the usage. Um, so I can see the type of flow in use. Is it a scheduled flow, a button click flow, a system event? I can see the flow name, the number of runs and the flow creator. Um, so if I require more information, I can reach out to that maker. I can see errors here, really important information, breakdown on what is failing within a flow, so forbidden, unauthorized access, specific action has failed, um, bad gateway. And I can drill down and get a, a deep dive into those specific flows. I can see the, the amount that has failed um, and who the owner is, so I can again reach out to the, the owner um, and ask them to check that flow. Another important information here is the connectors tab. It shows me the connector usage for a specific environment over the last 20 days. Um, so I can really see how my users are using the platform, what they are connecting to. And for each connector, I can see how many flows are involved and how many flow runs um, are occurring for that specific connector. Under Power Apps, I've got similar information. I can um, drill down into the usage. Um, so I can see the player that is being used. So that could be Windows, iOS, Android player. 
um, what player version uses are on, but I can also drill down into the errors and the performance for specific applications. Again, per environment, I can see the best performing service and the least performing service, and I, I can identify potential um, throttling issues or um, setup issues, for example, with an on-premise gateway. And then similar to Power Automate, I can also get the connector usage for Power Apps. And again, it's for a specific environment for the last 28 days. You get the information on how often a specific application was launched, um, how many connectors it's using and how many people the application is shared with and drill down into the specific connector that you're interested in finding out. Going back to the left hand side here, I've got resources and I can see my Dynamics 365 applications and I can install them from there. Um, so. And I can see the portals that are installed and um, configured across all of my um, environments. Uh, from the public from Admin Center, I can also raise support requests and support tickets. I've got data integration and data, data gateway options, and then the ability to create data loss prevention policies, which we'll cover a bit later. A key part of securing the Power Platform is establishing an environment strategy. Developing an environment strategy means configuring environments and other layers of data security in a way that support productive development in the organization while securing organizing resources. The Power Platform is built in distinct environments. Environments are basically containers that administrators can use to manage apps, flows, connections and other assets, as well as permissions to allow organizational users to use those resources. Environments can be used to target different business units or use cases, and also for different purposes, such as development, test, and production environments. The actual number and purpose of environments in your tenant is up to you as an administrator. And there are some key facts that you should know about environments. Environments are tied to a geographic location that is configured at the time the environment is created and can't be changed afterwards. Environments can be used to target different audiences and different purposes. Every tenant has a default environment where all of the users in your Azure AD tenant can create apps and flows. Non-default environments offer you more control around permissions. Like I've mentioned, there's different types of environments and it's important to understand the characteristics here. A trial environment expires after 30 days. It is limited to one per user. It can be used for short-term development testing, and personal exploration of the product. Provisioning trial environments can be restricted to admins. A developer environment is limited to one per user and only the developer has access to it. It is created via the community program. Developer environments can't be shared, nor do they affect other users. They are not meant to be used as production environments for applications. Provisioning developer environments can be restricted using a support ticket. Only a single user account with the community plan has access to that environment, and apps and flows created as part of that environment can't be shared with other users. Every tenant has one default environment. It is mainly used for personal exploration and productivity by extending Office 365 services. The default environment should not be used to host production applications. You can't block the automatic provisioning of the default environment. As an admin, you have limited control over the default environment. All licensed users are environment makers. Then there's the sandbox environment. It's a non-production environment that enables some additional options like copy and reset. It can be used for development and testing, separated from production. Provisioning sandbox environments can be restricted to admins, but conversion from production can't be blocked. Developers require environment maker access to create resources in the sandbox environment. If used for testing, only end user access is needed. And then there's the production environment, a non-expiring full environment that's, that's used to host production solutions. It requires one gigabyte of CDS database capacity to provision. Provisioning production environments can be restricted to admins. And we recommend that in production environments, you restrict end user access as much as possible, um, just enough to use the application. Do not give anyone maker access unless they require it. Um, there's some specific guidance for the default environment to call out because of its very unique nature. It is automatically created with the first user in the region closest to your Azure AD tenant, so you can't pick the region of your default environment. New users added to your Azure Active Directory with appropriate seeded or dedicated licenses will automatically be added as environment makers, but are not automatically added to the environment admin role. 
The default environment can't be deleted, but you can rename it, for example, the personal productivity. The default environment should not be used to host production solutions. It's designed to be an open environment that allows users to extend Office 365 or to build personal productivity applications that don't affect many people. You can lock down this idea by adding a DLP policy that restricts the usage of which connectors can be used in the default environment. Now that we've talked about the characteristics of environments, let's talk about best practices in establishing an environment strategy. Identify who will manage your Power Platform products and assign those admins the Power Platform Service Admin role. This role provides administrative access to the Power Platform and can be used for admins that do not need global tenant admin access. Restrict the creation of net neutral and production environments to admins. Limiting environment cre creation is beneficial to maintain control in general, both to prevent unaccounted capacity consumption and to reduce the amount of environments that you have to manage. If users have to request environments from central IT, it's easier to see what people are working on and admins are act as the gatekeepers. Treat the default environment as a personal productivity environment for your business groups. Renaming the environment is recommended to make the purpose of that environment self-explanatory. It's also important to clearly communicate that default is never to be used for production apps, but only for personal apps. Establish a process for requesting access or creation of environments. With environment creation locked down and default reserved for personal apps, make it clear to developers in your organization that a proper development project should be started by requesting a new dedicated environment where there is clear communication of intent and support between the developers and the admins. Use dev, test and production environments for specific business groups or applications. Having staged environments ensures that changes during development do not break the end uses in production and data is not corrupted. When resources are limited, focus this pattern for mission-critical and important applications or on business units who need their own dedicated space most. To host workshops, hackathons and internal training events such as App in a Day or Flow in a Day, create a new separate environment for these events to keep everyone organized. Ask users to save the resources they need after the event and then clean up the environment and reset it for other events. That prevents having 50 or 100 device ordering applications in the default environment. Based on successful experience with other customer engagements, here are some further recommendations that, that can help make managing environments easier. Create a service account that Central IT manages to deploy to test and production environments. This allows all members of IT to manage resources and that he will be aware of production grade applications that are in deployment since they're involved in the implementation. When displaying the details for an application, it will also show the service account as the creator and not the maker. This will help end users know who to contact in case of application issues. Use security groups to manage access to applications flows and CDS security roles. This removes the burden on an admin to update access for individual end users. And it also means appropriate starter, mover, and lever processes can be established and linked to the security group. It is recommended to separate development environments as much as possible and specifically avoid simultaneous app development for critical solutions in the default environment. If environments are created for development purposes, put a deadline on how long the environment should be available to the developer and have a process in place to back up and remove them. Although it is important to make sure resources are reasonably partitioned between pro projects and business units, it's still important to find a good balance between security and feasibility. Managing shared test and production environments is a good way to facilitate a large number of important solutions while preserving capacity and following best practices still. This maintains restricted permissions because test and production have restricted environment permission and therefore the end users can't modify the applications in those environments. There are some factors that will influence when to provision which types of environments. The tier of application support. So is it a mission critical scenario? How many users are impacted? Is robust application lifecycle management needed? The capacity you have available in your tenant as each environment will consume one gigabyte to initially provision. And the admin involvement. So automating environment creation and cleanup will help reduce the manual effort on the admin. Let's now look at how to manage environments in the Power Platform Admin Center. Um, so I'm in the Power Platform Admin Center, PPEG. I've got environments on the left-hand side open. 
Um, I see an existing list of all my environments and I can create new ones from here. Um, but first what I want to do is I want to restrict the uh, creation of new production and trial environments for my tenant. Um, so click on the cog up here, I select Parquet from settings and then from here I can restrict the creation of production and trial environments to only specific um, administrators. Um, and that's global admins, Dynamics 365 admins, and Power Platform service admins. Um, so good thing that's already done for this tenant. So I can save my settings here. Then close out of the settings. Um, the other best practice is to rename the default environment um, to personal productivity. Um, so I look for my default environment here, select that. And then I click on edit to edit the details. And from here, I can change the Contoso default to personal activity. Here, um, and I can save the setting here. I can also create a new environment. Um, so I need to give that a name. Um, I select a type, so I've got sandbox, production and trial environment. Um, we've talked about the differences um, earlier. Um, there's two more environment types. Um, default, you've only got one per environment, so you can't create an additional one. And developer gets created through signing up to the community plan, so you also can't create that from the admin center. Um, you then select the region, so you select the region closest to you or your business unit. Um, you can um, describe a purpose and you can select to create a database for that environment, which creates the common data service underneath. Um, we'll walk through the differences between creating a database and not creating a database as well, but uh, for this environment I'll select yes, create an environment. And then in the next step I'll choose a language, a currency, um, I can choose to enable Dynamics 365 apps in addition to Power Apps, can deploy sample apps, and I can specify a security group, which means that the environment access is restricted to people in the security group. Um, so if you click on select here, I can see the deep integration with Azure, Azure Active Directory, um, where all the um, security groups are available and I can choose from there. Now let's look at the differences in um, security roles for environments with CDS and without CDS. Let's first look at an environment without a common data service. I've previously created one. If I select that, I can see that I have the option to add a database. So I can add a common data service to that environment and I can see the environment roles or environment admin and environment maker. If I select see all here, I can see all the makers of that environment. I'm currently there's no one there. Um, I can select add everyone um, to add everyone in my organization as a maker to that environment. And I can add specific people or groups as makers to that environment. So I'll add them to the environment maker security role. If I search for someone here, I can again see the deep integration with Azure Active Directory, where users in my Azure AD tenant um, can be added as makers to that role. And I can simply select add here to add them to that maker role. Let's now look at an environment with CDS. Um, so the Contoso CUE environment. Um, I can see the database version here. In order to manage security roles and users, I click on the settings option here. You can see users and permissions. If I select security roles, I can see all the security roles in this environment. And I can create a new security role from here. Um, so for example, CUE maker security role. And I can then decide what level of access um, to specific entities that security role has. If I select core records here, I can see the account entity and all the actions that can be performed on that entity. And I can decide what level of access this security role will have on that entity. Um, so it starts with access to read my own records, to read my business unit's records, to read my child business unit records and to read my organization records. So the key is um, identified down here. If I want to change the settings for all the actions of that entity, I can click on the entity name here and change all the settings um, in one go. And the same applies to custom entities where I can look for the custom entities that have been created and I can decide what level of access that security role needs. Um, if I save and close that, it creates the security role. I can then go back to the environment settings. I select users. I can see all the users in the environment. Um, and if I select manage users up here, um, from here I can select a user where I want to elevate the permissions from an environment maker to include the permissions of that newly added security role. Um, so select a maker here, manage roles, 
and I can select a new security role here, select OK, and I've now elevated the permission of Alex from an environment maker to include the entities that we've just specified. There's one more setting on the environments that I want to call out, and that's the refresh cadence. If I click on edit, I can change the refresh cadence from moderate to frequent. If I hover over the information button, it tells me what that refresh cadence means. And it means how often you get Power Platform updates to your environment. If I select a link here, it takes me to the documentation um, where it specified what Power Platform components are included in the refresh cadence. Um, so currently it's only the Canvas App authoring experience, so the Canvas App Studio, and you can decide if you want to get frequent or moderate updates um, to that experience. If you're looking at ALM scenarios, so moving a solution from one environment to another, it is, it is important that the refresh cadence is the same for both of those environments to ensure the studio, the Canvas app authoring experience, is on the same version. The next concept we will look at is data loss prevention policies. An organization's data is critical to its success. Data needs to be readily available for decision making, but it needs to be protected so that it isn't shared with audiences that shouldn't have access to it. Data loss prevention policies are an effective tool for our admins to architect data governance for their tenants. As you know, the power of the Power Platform is inherent in the rich and ever-expanding ecosystem of hundreds of Microsoft and non-Microsoft service connectors that can be leveraged in your apps and flows. These connectors provide you with a declarative, low-code way to connect your apps and flows to more than 300 cloud services. They also allow you to use the Data Gateway model to connect to your on-prem resources. Not only that, you can build your own custom connectors to service endpoints and bring them into the Power Platform. As they say, with great power comes great responsibility. And the key to harness the tremendous power of this global connect to data platform in a safe and secure way is the ability to segregate business data from non-business data and prevent data exfiltration. Simply put, data loss prevention policies enable you to isolate business data from personal use data within the Power Platform. You can do so by classifying connectors across business and non-business groups using DLP. And additionally, you can also choose to block certain connectors from use within the Power Platform completely. Business and non-business classifications basically draw boundaries around which connectors can be used together versus not in a given app or flow. In these examples, admin have put the SharePoint connector in the business category and Dropbox in the non-business category. Makers can therefore no longer make apps and flows that use SharePoint and Dropbox together. Makers can continue to use the SharePoint connector standalone or together with other business connectors, such as Excel, Outlook, and SQL in this example. Similarly, makers can continue to use Dropbox with other non-business connectors, such as Gmail and Google Drive, leveraging the Power Platform for personal productivity scenarios. By isolating SharePoint from Dropbox, Admins have disabled Maker's ability to transfer data across these two services. It's critical that you take your time and carefully identify all the relevant business data connectors and isolate them from the rest of your connectors. Do note that the name business and non-business to these connector groupings do not have any special meanings. It is simply a label. We can switch the tag on these groupings and the net effect will still be the same in that SharePoint and Dropbox can't be used together while SharePoint and Outlook can. It is the grouping of the connectors itself that's of significance and not the name of the group. In this example, you will also note that Twitter and HTTP are marked as blocked. Blocking connectors is an important new capability in the Power Platform. In this example, you will also note that Twitter and HTTP are marked as blocked. Blocking connectors is an important new capability in the Power Platform. This disallows their use altogether in apps and flows. It is important that as an admin, you don't get trigger happy with connector blocking and use it sparingly. Invest time evaluating the risk versus the reward profile and find balance between protection and productivity. So just to quickly recap, Power Platform DLP supports three types of connector classification. Business or non-business groupings govern which connectors can be used together versus not, allowing you to segregate business sensitive data from non-business data. Blocked, on the other hand, blocks the connector from use altogether. Power Platform allows blocking of all Microsoft-owned premium connectors as well as all third-party connectors, so standard and premium third-party connectors can be blocked. However, Microsoft owns standard connectors such as Office 365 and native Power Platform connectors, as well as the common data service, are not blockable and can only be classified as business and non-business data. For each DLP policy you create, you will specify default categorization setting for new connectors. 
All three categories, business, non-business, and block, are available for you to choose from. When a new connector gets added to the Power Platform, that connector gets added to the default category until an admin reviews it. You can set up notifications to receive an alert when new connectors are added to the platform, so you can immediately review them and automate the process here. Let us now look at the type of DLP policies. The Power Platform supports tenant-level and environment-level policies. The key difference between these two is that tenant-level policies can be associated with more than one environment in the tenant while the environment level policy only applies to a single environment at a time. Tenant level policies can only be created by the tenant admin role, such as the Power Platform Administrator or the Global Administrator. Tenant level policies can be viewed and updated by any tenant admin, even if they were not the original creator of the policy. Environment admins can also view tenant level policy settings if they apply to one of their environments. They are however not allowed to change those policies. A key limitation for tenant level policies is they do not support custom connector setup. That's because a custom connector is tied to a particular environment and is not available for multiple environments at a time. Let's now look at environment level policies. These can be created by designated environment admins and have a one-to-one -one mapping to a single environment. All environment admins for the applicable environment, as well as tenant admins, can view and update environment level policies. Environment level policies do support custom connector classification through DLP PowerShell commandlets. At the moment, the DLP UI doesn't support custom connector classification. Let's now look at the different environment scope settings across the two policies. As mentioned, tenant level policies are multi environment. They support three different scope settings for admins to choose from. By default, tenant level policies apply to all environments. Admins can, however, choose to exclude certain environments from the DLP policy and apply to the remaining environments. Or admins can apply the policy to only select a select set of environments. It is typical of tenant admins to use a complementary combination of exclude and include environment policies to manage the un unique connector requirements for different stakeholders and across the organization. On the other hand, environment policies can only be applied to one environment at a time. An environment selection is mandatory at the time of creating the policy. Multi Environment selection is not available for environment policies, even if an environment admin is managing more than one environment. So they will need to create individual DLP policies for each environment that they manage or coordinate with the tenant administrator to set up a multi-environment tenant level policy. A frequent question we get asked is if tenant policies are a higher order to environment policy. Actually, all applicable policies are evaluated together to enforce the most restrictive data flow rules in the associated environment. There is no strict hierarchy between these policies. Tenant level policies cannot be used to remove restrictions imposed by the environment level policy and vice versa. As expected, once admins create DLP policies and add appropriate environments in the scope, it restricts app and flows from violating these policies at both design time and at runtime. At design time, app makers that are trying to use blocked connectors or mismatched connectors across business and non-business groups get a denial, and they're not allowed to save the violating connection in their app. Flow makers, on the other hand, are allowed to save a flow, but is immediately marked as suspended, along with an appropriate warning to the maker. A suspended flow will never run until the maker resolves the issue and brings the flow back into compliance. Even if an app or flow may be working fine upon creation, it may still end up in violation of the DLP policy later on in its life cycle. This would typically happen as a side effect of admins updating existing DLP policies or creating new ones. This is where runtime enforcement for DLP policies comes into play. In this scenario, apps will check for latest DLP policies at launch time and will fail to launch with an error if they are in violation. Similarly, existing fl flows will frequently pull against the latest DLP policies and will end up in a suspended state if they are in violation. Makers can edit their apps and flows to bring them back into compliance by removing the conflicting connections that they've, that they've put into the resource. Makers can edit apps and flows to bring them back into DLP compliance by removing the conflicting connections. Alternatively, if there is a legitimate business need for a particular connection, which the current DLP settings do not accommodate, then the maker and the admin can work together to figure out the right updates to the existing environment or to move the um, application and flow to a different environment. It is possible to use management connectors to see the impact a DLP policy change would have on apps and mitigate that by reaching out to the app maker versus breaking the app. 
Similarly, a process for app makers to request connectors, environments, or DLP policies for their use cases could be automated. We have a template implementation of some of these scenarios called the Series Starter Kit that we will look at later. Let's dive into a complex topic now. The net outcome of multiple tenant and environment level policies is a regular source of questions and confusion that we hear related to the power platform data loss prevention policies. Essentially, what happens in a multi-policy scenario is that all relevant policies applicable on an environment are evaluated one by one on apps and flows. In order for an app or flow to successfully execute in that environment, it has to comply to all DLP policies. This concept is fairly easy to compute for blocked connectors. If a connector is marked as blocked in any of the DLP policies associated with the environment, then that connector can't be used in any app or flow within that environment even if other policies may consider it as a business or non-business connector. Blocking being the most restrictive grouping for a connector gets precedence over business or non-business classification. It does get quite tricky to compute the final outcome of connector mapping across multiple policies for business and non-business classifications, so we'll look at an example for that now. In this example, we've got two DLP policies applied to the same environment. We have policy X and policy Y. Policy X identifies the connectors for SharePoint, Office 365 users, and SQL as business data, Bing Maps, Gmail, and HTTP as non-business data, and Twitter as blocked. Policy Y identifies SQL, Gmail, and Bing Maps as business data, SharePoint, and Office 365 users as non-business data, and HTTP as blocked. The net outcome of these grouping restrictions when applied together is this. Twitter and HTTP are marked as blocked in at least one of the policies applied to that environment, so they can't be used at all. SharePoint and Office 365 users can be used together, as they are in the same group in both policies. In policy X, they are together in the business data bucket, and in policy Y, they are together in the non-business data bucket. As you can see, the name of the bucket has no significance. All that matters is that those two connectors are in the same group. Also, Bing Maps and Gmail can be used together, as again, they're in the same bucket in both policies. In policy X, they're together in the non-business data bucket, and in policy Y, they're together in the business data bucket. The SQL connector cannot be used with any of the other connectors. Policy X restricts its usage with Bing Maps and Gmail, and policy Y restricts the usage with Office 365 users and SharePoint. So it's the most restrictive setting that ensures that SQL can't be used with either Gmail, Bing Maps, SharePoint, and Office 365 users. As you can see, even with just two policies applied to one environment, it was difficult to compute the final outcome. For predictable outcome of DLP settings, we highly recommend to keep the number of simultaneous DLP policies active on an environment to a bare minimum. Regularly triage conflicting or overlapping policies and converge them into a smaller number of policies. Now that we've talked about the DLP concepts, let's look at some best practices. We recommend setting up a tenant-wide policy that blocks all unsupported non-Microsoft connectors and classifies Microsoft connectors as business data. Then further restrict what connectors can be used together for the default and potential training environments. For example, limit this to only Office 365 connectors. And then create additional policies or exclude policies for your specific production environments. Let's look at an example tenant setup for a financial service organization, say Contoso Corporation. Contoso admins want to support personal productivity scenarios, business applications, as well as center of excellence activity management through Power Platform apps and flows. The environment strategy Contoso admins have applied here includes the default environment. Contoso admins have set up a tenant-wide restrictive DLP policy that applies to all environments in the tenant, except for some specific environments that they have excluded from that policy scope. Admins intend to keep the available connectors in this policy limited to Office 365 and other standard microservices and are blocking access to everything else. Contoso admins have also created another shared environment for employees to write apps for personal productivity use cases. This environment has a less restrictive DLP policies. It's not as risk averse as the default policy and allows makers to use connectors such as Azure services in addition to the Office 365 services. Since this is a non-default environment, Admins can actively control the environment maker list for it. This is a tiered approach to shared personal productivity environments and associated DLP settings. In addition, for the business units to create line of business applications, they have created dev test and production environments for their tax and audit subsidiaries across various countries. The environment maker access to this environment is carefully managed 
An appropriate first and third party connectors are made available using tenant level DLP policies in consultation with the business unit stakeholders. Similarly, dev test and production environments have been created for the central IT team to, use, to develop um, and roll out applications. These business application scenarios typically have a well-defined set of connectors that need to be made available for makers, testers, and users in that environment. Access to these connectors is managed using a dedicated tenant level policy. Control source have a special purpose environment dedicated to their center of excellence activities. In Contoso, the DLP policy for this special purpose environment will remain super high touch, given the experimental nature of this team. In this case, tenant admins have delegated the DLP management for this environment directly to the trusted environment admin of the COE team. They've excluded this environment from this, the scope of all the other tenant level policies. Um, this environment is managed only by the environment level DLP policy, which is an exception rather than a rule at Contoso. As expected, any new environments that are created will automatically map to the original all-environment policy that we've set up at the beginning. Do note that this setup of tenant-centric DLP policy does not prevent environment admins to come up with their own environment-level DLP policies in order to introduce additional restrictions or classify custom connectors. Let's now look at a demo of how to create and edit DLP policies in the Power Platform Admin Center. Let's now look at how to create and edit DLP policies in the Power Platform Admin Center. So I'm back in the Power Platform Admin Center and I've selected Data Policies on the left-hand side of the navigation. Here I can see a list of existing DLP policies that apply to the tenant who's created it and what environments they apply to. I can also create a new policy, so why don't we do that first. Select New Policy, input a name, select Next, and here I can now categorize all available connectors into business, non-business and blocked. You can see up here that the non-business data bucket is a default bucket for that policy. I can click on set the default group to change the default group to either business or blocked. That means any new connectors that are get added to the Power Platform will automatically get added to the blocked bucket. Let's now select the connectors that I will want to work with in the environment. So it's initially the Power Platform Admin connectors. So I'll move those to business. It's the Common Data Service. And then I know I will also need to use some of the Office connectors, like Office 365 Outlook and Users. In terms of blocking, the only thing I really want to block is the exfiltration of content to social media. So I'll select the Twitter connector and block that. Then also the Facebook connector and I'll block that. If I now look at my policy, I've got 10 connectors in the business data bucket. That's the common data service and the power platform admin connectors. I've got two connectors in blocked and the rest of the connectors in non-business data. Um, next, I select the scope. Um, so do I, want to apply, do I want to apply that policy to all environments, to multiple environments, or to all environments, excluding certain environments. So here I select add multiple environments, select next, and then I can select all the environments that I want this policy to apply to. I've actually named my environment similar to the policy. So if I search for CUE here, I can select all of my CUE environments. I can select add to policy, and I've now selected to apply that policy to those environments. Select next, I can review my policy and I can create it from here. Back under data policies, I can also review existing policies. Um, so for example, here I can see that Lee has previously created a Contoso CV prod policy. I can select it, click on edit, and then review which connectors are in the blocked bucket, in the non-business data, in the business data bucket of that policy. I can review the environments that that applies to, that only applies to the Contoso CV environment, and then save the changes. To Additional to the experience that we've just looked at in PPAC, you can also use PowerShell commandlets and the Power Platform admin connectors to create and modify DLP policies. In summary, data loss prevention policies are like recipes that enforce rules of which connectors can be used together. Connectors are classified as business data only, no business data allowed, and blocked. Tenant admins can define policies that apply to all environments. Additional to some of the new capabilities that we just talked about, like blocking connectors and the new user interface in PPAC, we have a rich roadmap for data loss prevention policies. 
We're investing in making DLP policies more granular and powerful, such as through endpoint filtering and connector action control. We're also investing in some fundamentals, such as custom connector parity with the UI and audit logging of DLP changes. We're also aligning Power Platform DLP with Microsoft Information Protection by enabling DLP to recognize sensitivity labels. And lastly, we're making the user experience more intuitive and informative by providing impact analysis of DLP policies and showing interaction summaries of policies. We've now explored two core concepts of securing your tenant, establishing an environment strategy, and setting up DLP policies. Let's now look at the other layers of security available to you as an admin to secure your tenant. We typically talk about five layers of security. At the highest level, the tenant level, you've got Azure Active Directory, built in support and integration with Azure AD Conditional Access, as well as all of your users that are provisioned in Azure AD will be available to use in the Power Platform. As soon as you provision an environment, you have the environment admin and maker roles, admin for administrative tasks and maker to create resources. Then you've got your resource level permissions to use or create apps and flows. The common data service, which is also something that you would provision, gives you a wealth of rich business logic and powerful security model, where we're introducing a role-based security and you can go down to record and field level permissions. And on the side of that, you've got cross-tenant, which dictates what other tenants your users can connect to from the Power Platform. With Azure AD, you can set up conditional access policies, managing timeout and access requirements. You can use Azure AD groups to manage and share app and data access. And you can also use guest users in your AD to share apps with external users for B2B collaboration. We've looked at this earlier when we looked at environments in the Power Platform Admin Center. That is, there is a distinct difference between environments with CDS and those without CDS. At an environment level, you have three access controls. The environment role, so your maker and admin role, the resource permission, so the permission to specific flow and app, and then the CDS security role if you're using CDS. At the top level, there's four roles that can be assigned in an environment, which ensure granting privileges and permissions to users based on their job function. There's the environment admin or system administrator role. It's got complete ability to customize and administrator the, the environment, full read and write access to the data in the database, and you can't modify that role. You should therefore take care in assigning that role to the right people. Then you've got the system customizer role, so full permission to customize the environment. The data access here is focused only on the data owned by the user. The environment maker role um, gives you access to create new resources in the environment, so apps, flows, gateways, and connections. There is no default privileges to data included. This role can be modified, but we wouldn't recommend it. And then you've got the common data service user. It's a basic user role with the ability to run applications and perform common tasks, but not the ability to customize the system. The data access is focused on read access to the most common data model core entities with full access to records owned by the user, so a self-privilege. It's a good role to copy and make a custom security role for your users, including the entities that you have in your solution. With tenant restrictions, organizations can control access to SaaS cloud applications based on the Azure AD tenant that the application uses for single sign-on. For example, you may want to allow access to your organization's Office 365 applications while preventing access to other organizations' instances of these same applications. With tenant restriction, organizations can specify the list of tenants that their users are permitted to access. Azure AD then only grants access to these permitted tenants. For outbound restrictions, those can be restricted for all cloud SaaS applications using Azure AD tenant restrictions or you can raise a support ticket to block this at the API hub level for Power Apps and Power Automate only. For inbound access, you can raise a support ticket to block this for Power Apps and Power Automate only. Support for this in the Power Platform Admin Center is coming soon. Now we've looked at all the concepts of secure, let's look at monitor. You have rich analytics in PPAC through which you can gain insights into adoption, usage and health across all the services apps, CDS, automate, and capacity. We've looked at that earlier during the demo of the Power Platform Admin Center, so I won't spend too much time on it here. We then also have Office 365 Activity Logging, where activities like creating an app, sharing an app, launching an app are stored in the Office 365 Audit Log. Office provides you an API to connect to that data. So you can take these audit logs and build your own dashboards to create a cross-tenant dashboard that uses the audit log together with the inventory information that you have in your tenant to give you an overview of all your apps, all your flows, all your makers, and identify trends over time. This example here comes with the Series Starter Kit. 
If you haven't already looked at the starter kit, we really recommend you exploring it. Lots of partners and customers are getting a lot of value from it, and we will also look at it in more detail later on. The new admin center also gives you detailed visibility into storage capacity of your Power Platform deployment. The capacity monitoring is critical to determine if you need to create additional environments or if you need to increase your storage limits. Now you've secured your tenant, you know how to monitor activity. Let's look at what's available to alert and act on specific behavior and to automate certain tasks. The management connectors available in PowerApps and Power Automate, as well as PowerShell commandlets, give you full control, full visibility into resources in your tenant, and the flexibility to build the policies you need to implement administration and governance requirements. PowerShell commandlets help make governance easier by enabling admins to automate governance policies. There are separate commandlets available for app creators and administrators. Partial commandlets can also be integrated with other services to automate processes end-to-end, -end. for example, to automate the full process from creating a user, assigning a license, to creating the environment all in one script. Admins can also easily create governance policies with management connectors offered by PowerApps and Power Automate, and there's even templates available that you can start using today. Let's now look at a demo of how to use the management connectors and the partial commandlets. Let's now look at how to use the PowerShell commandlets. So first thing I'd have to do is install the PowerShell admin commandlets for PowerApps. Um, so there's administrative commandlets and uh, commandlets that can be used by makers. I can then, for example, get a list of all environments in my tenant using get admin PowerApp environment. This returns me a list of all the environments, the credentials, the name, the ID, when it was created, and the location. I can also display the number of apps in each environment using get admin power app and some select properties. So here I can see it shows me the environment name and the number of applications in that environment. If I look at the documentation, it walks me through how to install the commandlets and what commandlets are available to me as an administrator and as a maker. Additionally, you'll find some common scenarios and how to use them with the PowerShell commandlets. Let's also look at how to use Power Automate to automate certain tasks. So I'm in the Power Automate Maker Studio. If I search for Power Automate up here, for example, I can see all of the management connectors that are available to me, and I can also see templates that are available. So for example, get a list of new Power Apps, flows, and connectors. This template gets me a list of new apps, flows, and connectors created in all of my environments. Let's also look at how to create a new flow from scratch. I'll create a new flow, and actually what I'll do is I'll create an instant flow that I'll manually trigger. If I search for Power Platform, the Power Platform Management Connector shows up here, and I can see what actions are available to me. They range from creating environments and CDS databases to deleting environments to editing environments, but also a few read-only actions, such as getting the environments and listing the DLP policies. What I first want to do is I want to get the environments as an administrator. I'll select my Contoso CV environment, I'll save that flow, and I can then test the flow. Now that the flow has run, I can see what the output is. So I search for the Contoso CV environment, and I can see that the output contains the region, the display name, the created and modified time, who's created it, the type of environment that it is, and some additional metadata here. Using the Power Platform Admin Connectors together with other flow actions such as approvals provides a really rich way of creating and automating your admin policies. As you look at automating your governance tasks, there's definitely some things that are easier with PowerShell and some things that are easier with the management connectors. Everything you do in bulk, so the bulk creation of environments, the bulk cleanup of environments, or the bulk reassigning of ownership after someone leaves the company, is definitely something that's easier with PowerShell. Also, reporting on how many users using premium connectors or data gateways is easier with PowerShell. Building your own administrative Power App, automating the environment creation using approvals or getting alerts when new resources are created, um, that's something that's easier with the management connectors. We've mentioned the CV Starter Kit before. It's basically a collection of components and tools that are designed to help you get started with developing a strategy for adopting and supporting the Power Platform with a focus on Power Apps and Power Automate. It uses the management connectors together with the audit log connectors to implement templates that you can use and customize. It comes in three components. The admin components intended to give the admin full visibility of what's going on in their environment. The governance components to archive unused applications and look at a sample audit process implementation. 
and the nurture components to onboard new makers, share best practices, and encourage adoption. Here are some of the templates that come with the CUE Starter Kit, but that you could also implement on your own. One of them is a welcome new maker template. This detects when new apps or flows have been created and sends a welcome email to the new maker containing internal and external resources that you can obviously customize. It's a really good way of wrapping your arms around a new user straight away and making them aware of your guidance and engagement process for using the Power Platform. Earlier, we discussed the importance of auditing your Power Platform deployment. In fact, the auditing process is also something that can be fully automated with the Power Platform. It's one of the powerful examples of how the platform itself can be used to support its own governance. In the example of the CV Starter Kit, the audit process identifies how many users an application is shared with, and if a specific threshold is reached, it reaches out to the maker and asks them to provide additional information, such as the business justification or the impact of an outage. An admin can then validate those requirements and assess the risk of the application. As part of governing the platform, looking at your application lifecycle management is critical. The PowerApps build tools are now available, offering seamless integration with Azure DevOps. The PowerApps build tools are a collection of common data service specific Azure DevOps build tasks. And those tasks are designed to allow ISVs and pro developers to move to a source centric development model and a fully automated deployment pipeline. Why is that important? Well, as the deployment of PowerApps expands across your business, so does the requirement of being able to automate the life cycle of the apps, managing it through source control and generally rub a little DevOps on it. After all, if I'm a developer, why do I have to treat the life cycle of my low code apps different to the life cycle of my custom code application? I want it all in the same place, in source control with proper versioning. This is the first of many planned steps towards a more comprehensive but much simpler story around ELM. We really want to enable our customers and partners to focus more on innovation and building beautiful apps uh, rather than figuring out how to automate and performing daunting manual tasks that are better done automated. A big part of managing and supporting the Power Platform adoption in your organization is also nurturing and educating your makers. It's such a great part, in fact, that we've recorded a separate session on this topic where we dive deeper into how to establish a center of excellence for the Power. I hope we have given you some food for thought and inspiration, and please continue your journey by checking out the admin white paper, the CV starter kit, and our hands-on admin in a day training.